It's one of our greatest fears. Being on a plane when something goes badly wrong. This series reveals what it's like to live through catastrophic events on board an aircraft. I just had visions of being burnt alive on this plane. Using footage that captured these terrifying moments. <laughs> and hearing from those who survived them. Everyone looked tense in their seats. It felt like this could be their final moments of their lives. I looked out to see some of the engine flying off. At that point, I planned to meet my maker. These are the world's worst flights. All right, we're going to land field right here. Worldwide, 100,000 flights take off and land each day. But coming back down to Earth safely is not always straightforward. Almost 60% of all fatal airline accidents occur during approach and landing. In this episode, drama in Hollywood, as mechanical failure leads to a terrifying landing. You need the landing gear to not crash the plane. Like, that's an important part of the plane. I'm in danger. Passengers face the nightmare prospect of ditching in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's so cold, the chances are you're going to freeze to death. And an engine explosion forces a plane into an emergency landing. If it breaks off and hits the tail, we're definitely going down. Twenty-first of September, two thousand and five. LA-based comedian and filmmaker Dave Reinitz was on his way to Hollywood Burbank Airport to catch an afternoon flight to New York. It was a particularly stressful day. Uh, just my girlfriend and I had had a, a big argument the night before. My girlfriend dropped me off, and we had a very cold departure. Uh, she was upset with me and I was really just wanted to sleep for five hours, six hours, get to New York and, and, and do my thing. Dave was filming a documentary in New York and carried a video camera in his hand luggage. Also on board was journalist Alexandra Jacobs, who was six months pregnant. This was gonna be the last flight to New York before I had the baby and I was eager to see, my parents lived in New York and I was eager to see them. At 3.31 p.m., JetBlue Flight 292 took off with 141 passengers on board. Conditions for the two and a half thousand mile journey to New York were good. The flight started really super normal. You know, they give you the, hey, this thing will float, you know, uh, don't you know, put your trade table up. And it was a very straightforward uh, start to things. I guess it was maybe 15 or 20 minutes into the flight, it became that something was up. The pilot came on and said, hey, we're having a little technical difficulty. When he made that announcement, I remembered I had a video camera. So I reached up and I got out the video camera and I started filming from inside the cabin. Dave recorded events around him. Several rows ahead, close to the front, was fine art consultant Lisa Schiff. The pilot came on and said, you know, hello everyone. I don't know if you've noticed, but we haven't reached altitude. 20 minutes after takeoff, they were still cruising above California at 14,000 feet. He said, you know, we're getting an, an unusual signal about our landing gear. That was a big red flag for me. People were already stressed. And some people were dealing with it quietly, and other people, there were upset throughout the cabin. There was a level of intensity that persisted the entire time on that plane. In the cockpit, an error message indicated a potential landing gear fault. But the crew had no way to see underneath the plane to check. The pilot, made an extraordinary announcement. He said, we're gonna go down to Long Beach, 
uh, which is the opposite direction of New York. And we're gonna cruise by the tower nice and low so they can get a visual inspection of the plane. So that got a little more serious, like somebody needs to look at this thing. I remember thinking, a flyby, like this is a jet plane. A flyby from Top Gun? For me, it was just, I was already starting to panic. At 4.20 p.m., they flew past the control tower at Long Beach Airport, hoping to get visual confirmation of the problem. The tower confirmed that the front wheels of the plane were twisted 90 degrees. Like, you need the landing gear to not crash the plane. Like, that's an important part of the plane. So the fact that that was messed up was scary. I'm in danger. Things were about to get even more surreal for the passengers. The pilot and air traffic control had been informed that TV news crews had picked up on the story. Here's live uh, TV feed from uh, Channel 4 in Long Beach. Yes, I know I'm on candid camera. They made their presence known. Flight 292's plight was being broadcast live across the nation. And incredibly, Dave and the other passengers could watch on board. It's absolutely surreal to be watching the story of the plane journey. Like, it was on national television. It was, and then, then I click, and it's on, it's on every station. It's like, this is what they're covering. Suddenly, the pilot made an announcement. They had like every military pilot giving their assessment of what our chances of survival was. I freaked out. Your heart is racing and the adrenaline is, is going through as if someone is chasing you and trying to kill you. The Airbus A320 was loaded with 31,600 pounds of jet fuel, which could ignite if the landing went wrong. At this point, what I'm doing is burning off uh, additional fuel. Uh, we took off with a full load of fuel uh, to go out to uh, New York. We're currently drilling holes in the sky around the uh, south part of Los Angeles, primarily to burn the fuel uh, load down to a, a more suitable level. We then flew out over the ocean for like 45 minutes. And that silence was really freaky. You start to think about what is going on. This was 2005. The memory of 9-11 was still very fresh. This idea that something horrible could happen, I think, was in all our minds. The plane continued circling, and minutes turned into hours. There were the people like me who instantly went hysterical. I started crying. The guy next to me is like, we're going to be fine. I'm like, no, we're all going to die. And then there were doers, people who needed a job. The thing I got out of filming was it gave me a role. I had something to do. So it gave me the opportunity to get out of my own head a little bit. It helped me to experience what was actually taking place on the, on the plane. picture of the people holding hands, I mean, it's a moving moment. I mean, to see people that intensely connected in a high-pressure situation. Flight 292 had been circling for nearly three hours. They hadn't found a way to fix the jammed wheels, but had burnt off enough fuel to try and land at Los Angeles International Airport. Air traffic control contacted the pilot. What do you think your uh, ETA is hey, now? We're down to uh, Bingo Field now at this time, Scott. I see 10,000 showing up here. Um, I think it's uh, time uh, for execution. Do you concur? Concur. The plane was about to come in for a white knuckle emergency landing, but the passengers were the last to know. 
they turned the televisions off. And that was spooky. What happened? What changed? What are you not telling us? 21st of September, 2005. JetBlue Flight 292's front wheel was jammed in the wrong direction. The pilot informed the cabin that he was going to attempt to land at LAX. Passenger Dave Reinitz was filming on his camera. They said we're, we're going to be making an emergency landing. I thought of my girlfriend, knowing how harshly we had parted. They had argued the night before. Now, fearing the worst, he taped her a final message. Hey, Bob, it's me. I'm watching the plane on the TV. We're having landing gear problems. We're going to crash land, or emergency land crash is a bad word in LAX. And uh, they're telling us everything's going to be fine, and it is, but just uh, thought I'd leave you a message just in case. It says, I love you. Everything is going to be groovy. Give Bosley a big hug for me. And uh, we'll have a good laugh when I show you this video. You say what a goober I am. But if anything happens, you know, take care of everything. Everything's yours. I wanted her to know it was okay. That yes, we had a fight, but you know, it's just a fight. We've been together for a long time. These things happen. The pilot contacted air traffic control for the final time. So let's make sure that uh, we've got all of the uh, preparations ready uh, for the uh, uh, arrival into uh, LAX. Uh, I'm sure you'll uh, be a hero here. Well, that's not the point. Uh, I just uh, want to make sure that everyone gets off the airplane, okay? The pilot chose to land at LAX, where the long runway gave him the best chance of success. Two kinds of dangers there. One, you can have a failure of the main landing gear. That is, it could collapse backwards, the nose of the aircraft could hit the runway. A second is that the heat generated from that scraping on the ground could throw off hot pieces of metal that if it punctures a fuel tank could lead to a fire or an explosion. At around 6.15 p.m., news helicopters captured the moment Flight 292 began its final descent into LAX. Dave kept his camera rolling. Brace, 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 brace. An automated voice began saying, brace, 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 very robotically. That was very, very scary. The stakes of, um, of dying are higher if you're pregnant. I, I'm not religious, but I, I pray. I really wanted my mom, you know, just, I wanted to say goodbye to my parents. As we come in, when we first hit, we hit, felt like we hit pretty hard. The pilot needed to keep the twisted nose gear off the ground for as long as possible. started to smell burning rubber. Intense, intense, thick smell of burning rubber. I felt heat coming up. I was scared. There might be an explosion. We're slowing down. And then all of a sudden, we, it, was, it got quiet for an instant. The pilot opened the door and he put his hand up like this. I remember hugging him on the way out. He was so good. I mean, he was a great landing. Oh, wait, that's me. Oh my God, that's me. I've never seen this before. Wow, we are so lucky.
as we're walking down the plane and I look back and I look at the landing gear itself and it is just sawed off like an absolutely symmetrical half circle. Pretty amazing. The passengers touched down to a media storm. But it wasn't only cameras there for Alexandra. My husband was there waiting for me. It was, it was just great to see how much he loved me. <laughs> An investigation later revealed what allowed the wheel to get jammed out of place. Part of the anti-rotation mechanism had fractured and separated due to fatigue. The Airbus steering system at the time didn't let the crew correct the wheel. This system has since been fixed. Even for people like myself who've been around aviation for a long time, frankly, I'd never seen a situation where an aircraft landed with a nose wheel twisted in this manner. All 147 people on board were unhurt, thanks in large part to the skill of the pilot. When landing an aircraft, there's little room for mistakes. And pilot error is the leading cause of airline accidents. This CCTV from LaGuardia Airport in 2013 shows Southwest Airlines Flight 345 coming into land nose first. The front landing gear collapsed and the plane skidded off the runway. Also in 2013, Asiana Flight 214 approached San Francisco Airport too low and hit the sea wall. Of the 307 people on board, three died and another 186 were injured. But sometimes extreme weather conditions are to blame. Dubai 2016, these passengers escaped a devastating fire when sudden wind changes caused their plane to crash land. All 300 on board survived, but one firefighter died. Eighty percent of plane crashes happen during the first three minutes or last eight minutes of the flight. But when disaster strikes mid-flight, it's the chance to contemplate your fate that can be most terrifying. As amateur pilot Randy Bryan discovered when he took a low-cost flight. I'm not an airline transport pilot, so, and I don't know jets, you know, all that much. But, you know, flying is flying, so there's a lot of things similar with my little airplane and to a big airplane. On the 15th of October 2013, Randy had been visiting his son in Colorado and was making his way back home to Atlanta. At Dallas-Fort Worth, he changed planes and boarded Spirit Airlines flight NK-165. When I got on the plane in Dallas, um, there were some smells, oil and stuff like that, but I didn't think too much of it. At 1.37 p.m., the flight departed from Dallas, heading for Atlanta. It was scheduled to take just over two hours. We took off and everything was perfectly fine and normal. I was relaxed. We're doing our climb out, climbing up the altitude, and there was a vibration actually in one of the engines that I could feel. After 11 minutes, the plane reached 19,500 feet. Flames shot down the side of the airplane. The cabin filled up with smoke so thick that I couldn't see my hand in front of me. Everybody started screaming. There was a lot of even panic in, in me, even though I'm a pilot and I'm trained for things. When the smoke had cleared, Randy got his phone and started filming. Did you smell the oil when we first started took off? You did not, I smelled the oil right away. Yeah. I, I fly a small plane, so I kind of recognize that smell. We were talking and scared and texting our loved ones. Randy's video captured the moment the cabin began to shake violently.
Some people thought it was my hand shaking, but it wasn't. I was actually shaking more than the video shows, not, not less. I really didn't know why it was vibrating as bad as it was. It didn't feel like an aerodynamic vibration. It was more uh, mechanical. The big military guy sitting next to me, you know, he was all nervous. I don't care who you are, it, it's a scary experience. You see people looking off into the distance, holding their head in their hands. Everybody was, you know, lost in thought or panicking. Pilots didn't say anything, the stewardesses didn't say anything. So we were there guessing and wondering what was going on without any information. 18 minutes after the explosion, the flight crew finally made an announcement to the cabin. breathing through his oxygen mask, it was very obvious. So every other word is which, you know, worried us even more. It's like, okay, he's on oxygen and we're not. Randy and the other passengers were not told why the pilots had their oxygen masks on. But he knew whatever was happening was a real threat to the plane. It was really something serious. I knew, you know, engine failure, if it breaks off and hits the tail, we're definitely going down. At around 1.51 p.m., the Airbus A319 turned back towards Dallas. There was a feeling of falling in the airplane and felt like we were going down. Um, and that was, that's like, okay, we're gonna die. At that point, I didn't want to see anything. I didn't want to look around, didn't want to do anything. So I buried my head under my jacket. The woman next to me, she was just kind of talking to me and seeking comfort from me. We had put the jacket over our heads and uh, just to kind of not see what was going on. I believe we'll be perfectly fine, okay? And I really believe that. I, I believe we're not gonna have any problems at all. Yeah, I've forgotten how uh, scared she was and uh, crying most of the time. our pilot. Also, folks, um, as we get ready for landing, we're going to have you get in your place positions at that point. Randy's footage picked up the sound of the pilots preparing the aircraft for landing. When I started going through the steps of that, everybody just kind of turned and listened to me. I was calming me down, being logical and methodical, at the same time calming them down. All right, folks, landing gear is down. We should be on the ground very shortly. We do need you in your brace positions. 25 minutes after the engine failure, flight NK-165 began its final approach. 15th of October, 2013, 2.10 p.m. 
Spirit Airlines flight NK165 had suffered an engine failure and was preparing for an emergency landing. Passenger and amateur pilot Randy Bryan was filming events on his phone. Knowing that this is it, I'm dead. But I'm not dead yet. It was tough. It really was tough. With just one engine working, the passengers faced a high-risk landing. With one engine out, you have one reverse thruster that can't be used. So the airplane, you know, uh, can't stop near as fast. So it takes up a lot more runway. Could have been other damage to the control surfaces, speed brakes. We were braced for impact. Actually, it was a pretty good landing. We didn't land hard or anything. It was just a very typical smooth landing. At Dallas, all 145 passengers disembarked, with no injuries reported. An investigation revealed that 11 minutes after takeoff, the plane began to vibrate when cracks inside the turbine caused the engine to overheat. By the time it was shut down four minutes later, large sections of the engine had been destroyed. If the turbine discs had been blown off, the plane would have been in grave danger. They're heavy, thick metal discs. They can strike the leading edge of the wing. They can damage um, hydraulic electrical services in the wing. They can hit the cabin. They can strike people in the cabin directly, uh, potentially even go and damage the other engine. Fortunately for those on board, despite the visible damage, the casing around the critical components had not been breached. The experience hasn't put Randy off flying, as long as he's at the controls. I did wish I was sitting up in the cockpit and knowing everything that was going on, because I could understand everything that was going on, and my mind wouldn't have to imagine. When you don't have any information to put in there, your mind is going to make it up, and it can get pretty crazy. Landing an aircraft is a huge technical challenge, and some locations can test even the most experienced pilot. But any landing strip will always be preferable to ditching at sea. In 2015, Ethan Williams was on a year-long round-the-world trip making YouTube videos of his adventure. Definitely worth it. Great views. A little bit scary, they didn't run everyone over, so... At this point, I think I was five months into the trip. I'd just come from South Korea. Uh, yeah, I spent, I think, right about a week in Seoul exploring around, and yeah, and I'd last minute decided to fly to America. On the 29th of July, Ethan was flying to the US via Hong Kong. At 12.55 p.m., Cathay Pacific flight CX-884 took off for LA. The journey was scheduled to take just under 13 hours. Some six hours later, over the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I was asleep on the plane and everyone else around me was asleep. Uh, and I woke up and I remember hearing a, a beeping noise. It was a noise I hadn't heard before, so straight away I knew it wasn't a normal alarm that was being sounded. Ethan reached for his phone and captured his reaction to events as they unfolded. Okay, so I'm not sure what's happening, but there's something going on on this flight. All the flight attendants are running around like crazy. Uh, there's warning signs going off. Um, hopefully it's nothing too bad. And um, we'll be alright, but you know, we'll see. It's definitely running around like mad. They're doing something, checking the emergency exits, and like grabbing bags and running forward. And I don't know, something's not right. The plane had suffered a critical problem, but passengers were not told what. Straight away my heart sank as soon as I heard the words uh, ditching. I knew the uh, survival rate was very low. 
because yeah, it's so cold, the chances are you're gonna freeze to death. It was one of the, the only times in my life where I actually thought I was gonna die. At around 9 p.m., flight CX-884 prepared to ditch into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Ditching is an extreme event that happens very rarely. It can be especially daunting because you may not have any idea how close you are to rescue. It could be a question of hours or even longer than that before someone can be on the scene. Ethan and the 275 other passengers were facing a nightmare scenario. Stranded in the freezing ocean at night, hundreds of miles from land, they would have little chance of survival. We all know the life vests are under your seat, but actually taking it out and ripping it out of that package um, was a very strange feeling. That was when you kind of think, wow, okay, this is, uh, yeah, this is really happening. You can look around the plane and you can see everyone else is doing the same thing, pulling on their life vest. I remember at that point thinking it was, it was a pretty serious situation. Flight attendants help the passengers to prepare for landing at sea. I remember taking a little bit of sense of achievement from that and being like, yeah, okay, I've got the brace position down. The cabin went strangely silent and everyone was just sat there um, in their own little moments. Twenty minutes after the alarm was raised, the passengers still had no idea what the malfunction was. The cabin crew made an announcement. You can actually see the big exhale that I make and there's uh, yeah, it's a, a huge sense of relief. Incredibly, in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, the flight crew had located a landing strip, a remote US Air Force refueling station on the western tip of Alaska's Aleutian Islands. We're really dark. They are pressured. As flight CX-884 approached the remote airstrip, it still wasn't out of danger. Ethan could only hope for the best. They just warned us that we were going to be having a particularly heavy landing because we still had a lot of fuel on board. Um, and they actually warned us that the brakes could potentially catch fire uh, at this point because we were so heavy. Quite a bumpy landing and quite heavy. And then there was yeah, very heavy braking. Eight and a half hours after takeoff, they were safe. You could see the relief in people's faces. Everyone was very relieved and happy to be on the ground and, and the situation was at least over. The details of the airline's investigation into the incident have not been made public. But they did release a brief statement. An equipment cooling fan below the floor had failed and the crew noticed smoke around the cockpit area. You could have the fire essentially eating through wires and the aircraft being in such a condition that's no longer flyable but the decisions made by the crew and executing their emergency procedures and landing that aircraft kept this technological problem from getting out of hand. 
ditching at sea had been avoided. In the end, the fault was minor enough that they could land normally. But when complex and integral systems on an aircraft go wrong, landing is fraught with danger. 29th of December, 2014. Gatwick was packed with people jetting off to enjoy some winter sun. Catherine Sterling and Alison Northcott were in a group of friends going to Las Vegas for a special birthday celebration. We all turned 40 within sort of three months of one another. So I thought, what a great excuse to go out and celebrate. I think we, we haven't done anything like it before. It's going to be an amazing experience. At 11.43, they took off on Virgin Atlantic flight VS-43 for the 10-hour, 45-minute transatlantic flight to Las Vegas. The Boeing 747 was close to full capacity, with 447 passengers and 18 crew on board. As we were still climbing and gaining altitude, I remember hearing a noise. I can only describe it as a clunk, it sounded underneath the plane. It was enough for me to think, mm, what was that? But not so much to be concerned. Just minutes after takeoff, the crew announced there was a problem. The hydraulics were malfunctioning, and one of the main sets of landing gear was jammed inside the plane. I got quite upset straight away, because I just thought, oh, you know, why us? At 12.08, the crew announced they had to return to Gatwick. But first, they needed to lose weight. One of the passengers filmed as flight VS-43 circled above the sea, dumping fuel. There's a lot of it. I've never seen anything quite like it, to be honest. This is a proper problem. This is not an insignificant thing. You could feel the tension. We seem to just be going around in circles for, for eternity. The 747 still faced a dangerously unstable landing. The pilot decided to take drastic action. At 2.35, he made an announcement. I'll try and dislodge this uh, gear door. Uh, if you can bear with us and uh, stay in the seat, what we'll do is uh, some maneuvers on. To dislodge the landing gear door, the pilot would need to push the 747 and its passengers to the limit. They were basically going to be shaking the plane to see if they could dislodge the, the wheel. I've had some experience, some turbulence on planes in my life, but this was a proper kind of dropping sensation. You could hear a level of anxiety rising at that point. After their white knuckle ride, Catherine, Alison, and the other passengers waited to hear the result. They came back onto the tannoy and they said, the landing gear is still trapped inside. We're gonna have to come in for an emergency landing. Flight VS-43 was in a holding pattern around Gatwick Airport. One of the landing gear doors was jammed. Friends Alison Northcott and Catherine Sterling were trapped on board. I think about my son and I think about my family and I think, gosh, this is, this is serious. I'm frightened. When you're left in that state of limbo, it's like torture, really. It's, uh, are you gonna be okay or not? One passenger filmed on their phone as the crew prepared the cabin for an emergency landing. When you hear the command, brace, brace, you must adopt the brace position shown on your safety card. You must stay in the brace position until the aircraft stops completely. Stay calm, read your safety card, and practice the brace position now.
amateur footage captured the moment VS-43 began its heart-stopping final approach. It was just so tense and just an emotional roller coaster, really. Thinking, when we land, the plane will fall, the wing will smash through the window, and I'm there by the window. The IR service at London's going, they don't want anybody to move seats on this aircraft or stand up or change position whatsoever. They secure the aircraft in position with a jack on the right hand side. So please, once we have landed and uh, the aircraft has come to a complete stop, we kindly ask that you do not move out of your seats. Four hours after takeoff, the 300-ton 747 came back in to land at Gatwick. So I'm saying, just don't look up. Just, you know, wait for impacts. The hydraulic fault meant they were landing without all the wheels down, and it also affected the plane's ability to break. Once the initial bang of the landing, it was really quiet. You're used to hearing that sort of hydraulic noise of the brakes. There was none of that. We were just kind of gliding. The aircraft was down, but could topple over at any second. I remember looking up to sort of see out of the window as I was in that sort of brace position. And I could see the ambulances and the fire engines. Emergency services and ground crew rushed to stabilize the plane. The guys up here are just saying that we just need to keep this aircraft stable. It's just that when people start to move off the aircraft, we're worried about it. So obviously we're taking every precaution at the moment so nothing does happen. And I was thinking, please, nobody get up and panic and, you know, nobody can, we shouldn't move from our seats in case we then topple. Everyone's 100% safe now, so, you know, chill out, relax, because there's nothing to worry about. So just bear with us for a little while longer. We really appreciate your patience. As soon as the aircraft was secured and the passengers unloaded, an investigation began. It concluded that a moving part of the landing gear used to extend and retract the wheels was installed upside down. One of the things that came out of the accident report was you've got to make sure that it's impossible to fit these, these critical components the wrong way around. Build it in a way that it's, it physically can't be done. And the aviation world is really, really good at learning from things when they go wrong. And changes have been put in place. All 465 passengers and crew on board flight VS-43 were safe and unharmed. I just remember being physically shaky and, and exhausted from having cried a lot. <laughs> I'd have to say it was the worst experience. It just brings things very acutely into focus. How fragile life can be and how things can change in a moment without you having any sort of control over it. Next time on World's Worst Flights, a hijacker takes a group of passengers hostage. I thought there's a terrorist here and he's just gonna bomb this plane. A bomb detonates mid-air, ripping a hole in the side of a plane, and a vicious struggle between passengers and the pilot. I felt the situation could turn really, really bad really, really quick.